sing to the Lord a new song. That's right, we are commanded to sing a new song. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are, my name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this of course is Bible Discovery TV Quick Study. Thank you for joining us and being a part of what we're doing as we go through the Bible. It's very exciting. We're in the book of Psalms actually. And Corey is here. Corey, what's up? Hi, well, today I'm going to be focusing in on the temple in Jerusalem that was built by King Solomon and in which a lot of the Psalms were performed. So that's coming up a little bit later. Ryan, what do you have for us? Well, today I'm exploring a strange and mysterious phenomenon of historical anniversaries that's governed the life of God's chosen people. All right, this I love this. The kids are at home for uh, physical distancing. It's fascinating. What did you do, Jen? <laughs> well, today we're gonna talk about praise, what that even means about God's judgment. All right, we'll talk about that and more. Stay there. Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Psalm 96. You know, God is not some egomaniac who must have the praises of his people. And actually, they have to praise him to survive. Rather, our praise to God keeps us from becoming so proud that we lose ourselves. Psalms speaks to our hearts wherever we are and wherever they are. Whether we are in a good place or whether we are in a bad place, the Psalms teaches us how to praise God always. Now, praise is an important discipline in times of great devastation, uh, be that economic or emotional devastation or otherwise. It reminds us of the good that we experience. It reminds us of the love that God has for us. In many ways, it saves us from despair. Like, for example, Psalm 96, most of the Psalms begin by praising the Lord. Even the Psalm that are cries of desperation still remember the greatness of God and praising the Lord. When it comes to complaining about our bad times, let's remember to praise the Lord. And sometimes that's very hard to do. But as we study this today and as we look at it, we need to understand that God is telling us this for a reason. He's not telling us this because he's an egomaniac, that he's somebody who needs praise to survive. That's not why he's saying that. Beloved, we need to understand that praising God is a discipline that we develop. And as we go through life, it makes our life better and how we feel better and how we understand better. Now get your Bible guides and turn to today's passage. And if you don't have a Bible guide, let me invite you to write and get a hold of yours. You can write to us or you can call us. Or a better way to do that is to go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. Remember the TV, 
BibleDiscoveryTV.com. When you go there, click on the Bible guide and it'll take you to a page. Uh, make a donation and you'll get to a page of PDF files. You can see it there. Or you can also just ask them to send it to you. We would love to do that. And thank you so much for those who have been faithful. I'm telling you, we have seen God do absolutely amazing things, amazing things in the past three months. It has been outstanding. Thank you. And uh, we praise God for all of the faithfulness of many people watching this program. Now, as we look at this, let's focus on this, learning to praise God. Father, I pray today that as we look at learning to praise you, because some of us are not in positions to praise you. We're in positions to complain and we're in positions to just, you know, cast out this and yell at that and everything. But help us to remember, Lord, that that's not the way you do business. You do business quite differently and you are the judge and we are the followers. So I pray in Jesus' name that we would hear what your word says. And we said together, amen. Turn to the first passage because it gets really interesting. Psalm 96 verses one through six. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord Bless his name. Do you think you want to sing to the Lord? Well, yes, it's telling you to sing to the Lord. And then it says, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Don't forget about it. Declare his glory among the nations. Everybody who listens to you, hear it. Doesn't matter where you're from. His wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Look at that. That's absolutely stunning. Now, this reminds me of the point one, strength and beauty didn't just happen by chance, didn't come by mother nature. God is the reason for strength and beauty, beloved. God is the reason for strength and beauty. Strength and beauty is, is wonderful. And God is the reason we celebrate that, the Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the reasons that we praise the Lord is because of that. And that's a good reason, but there's many other reasons. But we need to remember that it is God who is our source. And let's go back to the scripture because this is Psalm 96, verses 7 through 9. Now pay attention here because this gets really good. So as we look at this, it says, Give to the Lord, O families of the people. Families of the peoples. Now, this is very important to remember. God speaks to the people in families. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Look at that. The beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Now, this actually brings me to the second point. When we praise God, we acknowledge that he is all powerful and that he is beautiful. When we praise God, we acknowledge that he is all powerful and beautiful. Life from the Savior is absolute life. It's not just a fleeting time, just a quick 70, 80, 90, 100 years. It's not that because of sin, we die for the wages of sin or death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So we need to praise God because not only will this pain end, not only will our suffering end, but for eternity, we will praise God. So we need to, we need to remember that beloved. We need to keep that straight. Now let's go back to the scripture because it says something else. Psalm 96, 10 to 13 say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. 
Let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. And then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. Look at that line. For he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness. This is Old Testament here. And the peoples with his truth. Oh my goodness, isn't that something? This is where we learn something that we should remember. God will judge this world according to his truth. According to his truth. We should commit our lives to pursuing God's absolute truth. God's truth is absolute. And we live in a time when people have said in the past, well, your truth rod is your truth and my truth is my truth. But I want to declare to you that it's not my truth or your truth. It's the truth. The word of God explains who God is, explains the truth. And just when we thought we had it all together, you know, something comes up like a pandemic and we learn that we don't have it all together. Beloved, we learn that things are not that we can control them. This is what we need to understand. God is the superior being that we praise. And I would suggest to you that you come to Jesus Christ, invite him into your heart and forgive, ask him forgiveness of your sin. And when you do that, say, Lord, I, I, I need you to forgive me of my sin. Help me today. I need you to come into my heart and be the Lord in Jesus name. And we said together, amen. I hope you are still enjoying the Psalms as we're going through them on Bible Discovery. You know, we've we've reached roughly just, just past the middle mark here, and I'm getting really excited as we continue to go through. Today, I wanted to focus in on an aspect that is sort of related to the Psalms. We're going to be taking a look at the temple in Jerusalem, specifically the one that Solomon built. Uh, and many of the Psalms that we're reading would have been performed in the temple. In fact, many of them were written for temple performance. So let's take a look at an aspect of the temple, the doorways, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Take a look. The field of archaeology has helped illuminate the puzzling description of the doorways of Solomon's temple. 1 Kings 6 gives us a description of the outer and inner doorways of the temple as having four and five mezuzot. Today, the word is used to reference rolls of scripture kept in decorative cases on the door frames of faithful observance of Judaism. While the word is very closely associated with doorposts, the Old Testament isn't referring to four and five rolls of scripture on the temple's doors. It's referring to some sort of architectural detail. Recent archaeological work in Kerbet Kaafa, a site occupied for a brief time around 1000 BC, unearthed a stone shrine model with an interesting door frame. This model's door has three interlocking or recessed door frames. The visual effect gives the impression of three rows of lintels and doorposts, with each door frame getting progressively smaller as you would enter the shrine. This recessed detailing was also found on a stone altar at Kaafa, further solidifying its connection with the sacred or holy. The tradition of multiple recessed frames with holy places and objects is known from Mesopotamia and the Northern Levant, but wasn't utilized in ancient Canaan. From the Bible's description of Solomon's temple doors, however, now paired with the discovery of the recessed door motif in the earliest of ancient Israeli society, researchers believe that this is how we should understand the Bible's description. 
In the other cultures of the Near East, two to three recessed frames were common, but the Bible states the temple's doors had four and five frames, which could be a purposeful stylistic difference setting apart the worship of Israel. It's believed from surviving evidence that Herod's temple complex maintained this style. So it's not surprising then that after the destruction of the second temple in AD 70, synagogues and churches continued to incorporate recessed door frames into their designs. So for me, you know, I'm a Canadian. My country is a relatively young country and our architecture isn't about symbolic meaning. It's not really even about beauty most of the time. Most of the time it's about function. It needs to keep us warm, it needs to keep us sheltered, and it needs to be relatively cheap to put up. So this concept of ancient architecture and, and endowing it with, with so much symbolism, you know, it's, it's a very beautiful concept and one that we need to think about as we read through the Bible. And, you know, it is very common even still today to endow religious architecture or religious buildings with symbolic meaning. So there is that correlation into today, but it's a good thing to, to pay attention to some of these details in the temple because they do give us more of a window of insight into what was going on in the minds of the ancient Judeans. Right now, I'm going to pass it over to Ryan. Ryan, what do you have for us today? Thanks, Corey. Well, today's reading is Psalms 95 to 100, and on this episode, I'm focused in on Psalm 95, in which the psalmist pleads with God's people not to harden their hearts as they did in the wilderness. Now, this rebellion against God was a tragedy because it turned what was supposed to be 40 days into 40 years of wandering through the wilderness. Well, this rebellion happened on the ninth day of the month of Av on the Jewish calendar. And what's really unusual is that at least seven other major tragic events surrounding the nation of Israel would occur on this very day throughout history. Now, the question is, could it be mere coincidence that eight tragic events directly affecting the nation of Israel would occur on the same day? Well, you be the judge. Many proclaim that history belongs to God. History is his story. But does an examination of said history provide evidence for that claim? For many, and particularly the Jews, God can be the only reasonable explanation. That's because a strange and mysterious phenomenon of historical anniversaries has governed the life of the chosen people. Numerous key historical events, in fact, in relation to the nation of Israel, have coincided exactly with particular Jewish festival or fast days which had been previously established by God. Perhaps the strangest of these historical anniversaries is the 9th of Av, a single day on the Jewish calendar on which a series of at least eight national disasters have occurred. Even today, the 9th of Av is a national feast of mourning for the Jews, known as Tisha B'Av. The first in these series of unfortunate events occurred in 1446 BC. The Israelites are in the desert, recently having experienced the miraculous exodus, and are now poised to enter the Promised Land. But first, they dispatch a reconnaissance mission to assist in formulating a prudent battle strategy. Unfortunately, 10 out of the 12 spies return with a bad report, claiming that the land is unconquerable. For this public demonstration of distrust in his power, God turns their short 40-day reconnaissance mission into a 40 years of wilderness wandering, effectively preventing anyone from that generation except the two faithful spies from entering that land. A second tragedy occurred in 589 BC when the Babylonians destroyed the first Jewish temple built by King Solomon. Similarly, just as the Babylonians had destroyed their first temple, the Romans five centuries later would destroy their second temple. The date? The 9th of Av, 70 AD, an event foretold nearly 40 years earlier by Jesus Christ. Then, exactly one year later, the Roman army plowed with salt the site of the Temple Mount and the whole city as a symbol of Rome's utter defeat of its enemy. A few years after that, when the Jews rebelled against Rome, they believed that their leader, Simon Bar Kokhba, would fulfill their messianic longings. But their hopes were cruelly dashed in AD 133 as the Jewish rebels were brutally butchered in the final battle at Batar, again on the 9th of Av. Over a thousand years later, tragedy would strike yet again as the ruthless English king Edward I 
ordered the expulsion of all Jews from the nation in 1290. Following suit just a couple hundred years later, the Spanish government also ordered the expulsion of the Jews. Finally, on the 9th of Av in August 1914, as the Jews fasted and mourned, World War I was declared. Statistically speaking, it is virtually impossible that these eight specific events would all fall on the very day of the Feast of Mourning by simple happenstance. The only rational explanation is that God indeed is in control of history and is greatly involved with the nation of Israel. Furthermore, this same God will return to his people as their Messiah to set up his long-awaited kingdom, and the fasts and mourning will be turned into feasts of joy. Now, just in case you're still in doubt that God was involved here, statistically speaking, the odds that all eight historical events occurred by random chance alone on the 9th of Av, rather than by God's providential design, is just one chance in 873 quadrillion. And if you don't believe me, then by all means, do the math yourself. But I guarantee that what you'll discover is that the idea that these events all occurred by random chance is totally absurd and, and virtually impossible mathematically. History truly is his story, and it's not over yet. Remember, God's going to return to his people as their Messiah to set up his long-awaited kingdom, and the fasts and mourning will be turned into feasts of joy, both for Jews and Gentiles. You know, Ryan, I think it's important to remember, and that's one of the things we do in the Bible Guide is we put the, the date up there. Mm -hmm. And next year, we're going to try to get a little more um, information for the people so they understand that because the calendars don't always line up with the Judean calendar, but the Hebrew calendar is a solar calendar. It's very interesting. And what happens is uh, it, it's tied into feasts and festivals and all that right. kind of stuff. And uh, so it's good when we learn these days and when we learn the festivals and all of that, because God is going to do something. And I find that fascinating. And of course, there are a couple of times in the Bible when the calendar is messed up simply because God did some things like, the day that Hezekiah was told that he would live 15 more years. And then the day that the, that it stood still, the Joshua, stood still. it just stood still. I mean, like <laughs> nobody knows, like it stood still for a day, like what happened? And uh, so it's very, very interesting. Janice, what did you do? You know what, Rod? I love how the Psalms are so well set into place. And you can really see it here between Psalm 95 and Psalm 96, because 95 is a call to worship and a call to obedience that the psalmist draws us in. He puts into perspective, for example, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. God is that good shepherd that takes care of the flock. But then the psalmist says, today, if you will hear his voice, God's voice say, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, and they tried me. So he's taking us back to remember how the Israelites were towards God when he brought them out of Egypt and had them wandering in the desert. He's saying, don't harden your hearts, but, but come to me and know me and serve me and believe in me. And, and um, then it goes into Psalm 96, where it's a song of praise to God in coming judgment. That's why I said a song of praise, a praise for judgment. How, how can we do that? What does that even mean? Because, you know, as, as, as a child, I wasn't thrilled about discipline or judgment coming upon me. But here in the scriptures, we see the setup of this song of praise to God in Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation. We hear earlier in Psalm uh, 95 who we are and who God is and to come humbly, to understand who he is and who we are in him and understanding then that he will come. 
He will come and our praise for this time of judgment is that God brings righteous judgment. He brings true judgment. We can't bring true judgment, Rod, because we're imperfect people. But God will bring an end to sin and evil in this world. That is something to not only look forward to, but to praise God for his sovereignty, that he has a plan and that we shouldn't harden our hearts now. We need to make sure that our lives, Rod, are right before God. Mm -hmm. And there might be somebody watching today that doesn't understand what I mean. What do you mean I have to make my heart right? The Bible tells us, God tells us that there is no one who is perfect. There is no one who has not sinned except his son, Jesus Christ, that he sent, who was fully God and fully man. He came with the ultimate purpose to give his life on the cross as a sacrifice for us. His blood was shed as an atonement to make us clean, to make us righteous before God. And if we ask him to come into our hearts and to cleanse us with that blood and make us clean, he will do that. And not only did he die, but three days later, he rose from death in the flesh that gave us the gift of eternal life, that the same power of God that rose Jesus from the dead, he raises us when our bodies pass from this earth. If we have taken Jesus Christ as the Lord of our life and we follow him and love him, then we too, when we pass from this life into the next life, we're in his presence. Isn't that amazing, Rod, yeah, that, that we can have that salvation? Eternal life is that that's, eternal that's the life. gift of God. So we need to turn away life. from yeah. that rebellion of, of doing what we want to do when we want to do it and yeah. give our lives to Jesus. But I think that, and that rebellion is the, really the definition of sin. It is. And, and I think that if we, if we understand that and we realize that sin is real and it's something, you know, not everybody, you know, it's, we just assume everybody's born and this is normal life. This is not normal life. This world is bound by sin, but Jesus Christ has overcome the sin. And if we invite Jesus into our life and for, ask him forgiveness of our sin, invite him as Lord of our life, then he will help us to begin to get the work and overcome that sin and then help others and get with our eternal purpose because gift of God is eternal life.